Okay, so uh, for our second talk uh, of the afternoon, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Hintz from ETH Zurich, who will be telling us about uh, mode stability in shallow quasi-normal modes of courtesy of black holes. Peter, please. Thank you so much, Martin. And uh, yeah, thank you personally also directly for the invitation and uh, um, uh, the other organizers, I, uh, if, if there are even more, but uh, Martin was the main point of communication, so thank you. And uh, yeah, apologies for not coming in person. I have uh, various excuses. One is I'm teaching. The other is I have uh, two less than 18 month old kids at home. Uh, they require my assistance. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so this talk is going to be on uh, sort of a very um, basic fundamental problem uh, that uh, some people, at least for instance, the previous speaker has uh, worked on in, in some way or other. And um, so let me just give you a very general um, quick background why I'm interested in this in the first place. Um, this will not be news to most of you, um, but just so we're on the same page. Um, also, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt. And um, I might not be able to see the chat, but um, uh, perhaps somebody can then unmute themselves. Um, OK, so the goal is uh, the study of the long time asymptotics of linear or also of small amplitude nonlinear waves that propagate on uh, black hole space times in GR. And the um, two fundamental questions one can ask is, uh, of course, do waves decay at all, or uh, do they at least remain bounded? Um, in various contexts, one could call this the linear stability problem. And um, as we all know, this is uh, um, at least bounded. This is very easy if you have some coercive conserved energy, like for the wave equation on Minkowski space or on Schwarzschild. Um, but uh, proving decay is usually already more difficult. But even proving boundedness um, is highly non-trivial in the absence of such coercive conserved energies. And um, uh, space times that, for instance, have ergo regions are like current space times, um, are of course, prime examples of that. Um, if one, uh, someone knows or somebody tells you that waves do decay, one can ask, what is the decay rate, uh, inverse polynomial, exponential, perhaps? Um, and can one prove asymptotic expansions? Uh, so can one somehow extract a leading order term um, for the large time behavior of the solution of the equation um, plus a more decaying error term? It turns out that um, in the case that I'm going to talk about here, um, this question of proving asymptotic expansions um, is actually somewhat orthogonal. Uh -huh, very good, you can see my screen. It's somewhat orthogonal to um, uh, the question of actually figuring out what the decay rates are. One can, in some situations, prove asymptotic, the, the existence of asymptotic expansions, um, but the, um, say, exponents and the exponential uh, and the exponentials appearing in such an expansion, uh, they might not be um, determined uh, yet. So one, uh, one might prove an asymptotic expansion without yet knowing whether the solution actually um, might exponentially grow because some term in this expansion is exponentially growing. So you'll see some example of that um, as the talk continues. Typical applications of such uh, decay um, questions are, um, of course, as I already mentioned, global existence results for nonlinear wave equations. And in the context of Einstein's field equations, uh, the nonlinear stability of the space time or the family of space times under consideration. And for this concrete talk, the concrete goal, um, so the longer term goal, um, is to extend um, a result that I proved with Andras Vashi on the nonlinear stability of Kerr de Sitter black holes um, in the regime of very small angular momenta um, to a larger range of angular momenta. And uh, I will also explain what exactly this larger range is. It's not the full sub-extremal range that will be accessible um, with these techniques, but um, at least it will include um, a physically relevant range of large angular momenta and small cosmological constants. So this is somehow the um, rough setting. Uh, to become more concrete, let me remind you of um, what black holes in the sitter space look like um, geometrically. So we fix the cosmological constant to be positive throughout this talk. There will be some limiting regimes where uh, we also look at asymptotically flat space times, but um, lambda positive is the, is the setting of this talk. And Schwarzschild de Sitter space times, so SDS in short, are described uh, in addition to this fixed cosmological constant by a black hole mass, which um, is some positive number. And in, in reality, lambda, uh, lambda itself is positive, but extremely small. So the upper bound for m is uh, virtually infinite. Um, and in any case, um, we will ultimately actually be interested in the regime where m is very small compared to that upper bound, in fact, tending to 0. Um, so we will look at small mass black holes in some sense. 
Um, the metric is uh, explicitly given by this form here. Um, so we will actually use this form uh, close to the end of the talk. Um, and I will remind you of it. So it's a warp product metric where this warping function here, um, f of r, has this explicit form 1 minus 2m over r, like in the Schwarzschild case, minus lambda r squared over 3. That's the Pesitter part. And this function um, for these uh, black hole masses has two positive roots, r plus the event horizon and rc, the cosmological horizon. Um, and uh, the simplest form, the space-time manifold, is just the, um, the annulus in space with a radius interval exactly between um, the event and cosmological horizon. And you have a time uh, coordinate t sticking around 2, and then the two-sphere factor everywhere. This metric is spherically symmetric. For later um, purposes, uh, also note that when the black hole mass is very small, then the location of the event horizon is largely unperturbed by the presence of a cosmological constant and is roughly equal to um, the usual Schwarzschild radius 2m. And on the other hand, um, again, when the black hole is fairly small, um, the radius of the cosmological horizon, what happens at very large spatial scales, is basically undisturbed by the presence of a black hole. And uh, this cosmological constant is essentially located at the de Sitter value of uh, uh, lambda to the minus 1 half. Um, this metric is stationary, which will, uh, of course, be a key property in order to even define modes or quasi-normal modes. Um, and it's, um, except for some um, uh, degenerate limiting cases, the unique spherically symmetric solution of the Einstein vacuum equation with the presence of lambda. Um, as is well known, there is a generalization of the SDS metrics given by the curtis sitter family, discovered by Carter in 68, that also incorporate an angular momentum or a specific angular momentum of the black hole. Um, which I write down here is less than squiggly m. I will draw the, uh, the actual um, uh, sort of phase diagram for sub-extremal Curtis-Sitter black holes in a few slides. Um, so in the Kerr case, when you don't have a cosmological constant, um, the sub-extremal case for which you don't have a naked singularity um, would be that a is less than m. And uh, in the presence of a cosmological constant, actually, A might be even bigger than M, and you might still have a sub extremal black hole. Um, so I'm not going to write down the explicit metric for you, um, uh, but I just want to point out that it's, again, a stationary solution of the equations. It also turns out to be axisymmetric. That will not actually be um, of much relevance for this talk. And uh, it generalizes the schwarzschild de Sitter case. Um, OK. So the, um, these coordinates are, um, as usual, not very uh, appropriate for studying the long time behavior of waves or even doing analysis um, on such a space time. So if you look at the Penrose diagram um, of this Schwarzschild to Sitter space time, it's uh, depicted here. Uh, the levels of the time function bunch up near these um, uh, uh, near the uh, horizons there. And um, uh, in fact, of course, one can extend the metric in a better coordinate system analytically across both horizons. Um, again, this is very explicit, and I'm just going to write it down in some schematic form. Uh, so rather than using the time function t, use another time function t star, which is related to t via a singular coordinate change, roughly involving logarithms of uh, r minus the value of r at the horizon. Um, and the point then is that the level sets of this function t star are smooth and uh, transversal to the future event and cosmological horizon. Um, so uh, transversal to this and this horizon here. And uh, the metric in these new coordinates, if you do it right, extends analytically across the horizons. And here I'm just for the sake of definiteness um, in, uh, enlarging the space time to uh, a half times the radius of the event horizon and twice the radius of the cosmological horizon. But of course, these one half and two are arbitrary numbers less than one or bigger than one. And from now on, uh, I will exclusively focus on um, this future development um, or part of it of this uh, level set t star equals 0. And uh, I will be interested in the future evolution of waves with initial data posed at t star equals 0. OK, so the domain is now omega is this um, uh, future half line in time, or this new time coordinate t star, across um, this um, spatial manifold x, which is actually a bounded annulus. Okay. So um, this is the setting. Uh, so it's bounded because you have a positive cosmological constant. Otherwise, it would, of course, be asymptotically flat. OK, so this is uh, as much as I need to tell you to um, uh, tell you about sort of a fundamental theorem um, for linear waves, linear scalar waves for this talk on uh, Schwarzschild de Sitter and Kerr de Sitter space times. Uh, namely, we look at the initial value problem for the wave equation, and uh, we take the initial data to be smooth 
Um, okay, so phi and the time derivative of phi at time t equals zero are smooth, and uh, we just look at the homogeneous wave equation on a curtisator spacetime with parameters lambda, m, and a, and it will tell you what restrictions need to be imposed on uh, m and a with lambda being fixed uh, in order for the theorem at the bottom here to hold. Okay, so it's a theorem with a, um, a few decade history, and I will uh, give you the quick rundown on the next slide. Um, but the the rough of it is that the solution phi of this initial value problem has an asymptotic expansion as time t star goes off to infinity. And uh, I'm writing down um, sort of a, a simple version of this, which might not be quite accurate, as I'll explain in a second. Um, namely, uh, the solution phi of this wave equation as a function of time t star and the spatial coordinates x um, has an asymptotic expansion into um, harmonic oscillators with complex frequencies. So this might be a priori, these might be exponentially growing or decaying, or perhaps uh, non, not growing or decaying at all, but oscillating, you know, whatever complex numbers you might have for the omega j's. Um, okay, but these have uh, this particular exponential time dependence times some functions of uh, just the spatial variables. So the solution is a superposition of such, um, if you're lucky, damped harmonic oscillators in time with coefficients depending on space in some manner. So I'm ignoring multiplicities here. That's why this is uh, not quite accurate probably uh, because you might actually have uh, res I mean, uh, eigenvalues here, omega j's resonances with higher multiplicity or some Jordan blocks, in which case you would have uh, also polynomials in time and T star floating around, um, but I'm dropping them for the sake of simplicity here. Okay, so what do I mean by this squiggly sign here? It means that for suitable constants, and again, that depends on the, um, on the theorem on the paper uh, that I will refer to, for suitable real number C, um, you can subtract from the actual true solution phi a truncated sum where you only sum over those um, uh, omega j's whose imaginary part is bigger or equal than minus C, and uh, you subtract that truncated sum, and the remainder term is supposed to be decaying uh, like e to the minus C t star for suitable C. Ideally, C should be positive because it would say that uh, the solution phi is given by some expansion up to exponentially decaying terms. That's a good starting point. Um, okay, but uh, depending on the theorem, the value of C might be different. Just for the um, uh, for the quick mental arithmetic here, uh, the minus i times uh, omega j for such omega j's leads to this exponential term exactly not quite being uh, like e to the minus c t star decay. Okay, so in other words, the terms that I allow for in the sum here are those that do not yet, or perhaps borderline, do not yet have uh, the e to the minus c t star decay. I should also point out immediately that um, uh, there is a chance when c is big enough that the sum actually has infinitely many terms. So there are infinitely many of these uh, uh, omega j's, which will be the subject of the talk, um, with imaginary part bigger or equal than minus this large constant c. And then uh, you also have to concern yourself with proving that this uh, this infinite series here um, is actually convergent in some function space. Okay, so what are now the concrete settings uh, in which this theorem has been um, obtained? So here, just restate the, the theorem uh, just once more for your reference. Um, the first proof of this full expansion actually for any value of C was given by Bonnie and Hafner, um, but it was restricted actually to the black hole exterior region. So not up to the horizons, just in the black hole um, exterior strictly. And um, what they used in particular was um, work by Sabareto and Zworski from uh, the late 90s that gives some information about the omega j's, especially the large uh, real part omega j's um, so that they can control this infinite series. Um, and Sabareto, Melrose, and Vashi um, partially extended this result by Bonnie and Hafner and obtained this expansion up to the horizons, including the horizons, uh, but only for a small positive c. So I will also recall the sabareto zworski result um, in, in a slide or two. Uh, Dyatlov then, in a series of works um, in the uh, early part of the last decade already, um, obtained the same result for slowly rotating curtisator black holes, so very slowly rotating, perhaps I should say, when a is much, much less than m. And the same result holds true. Um, but uh, now it's uh, significantly more delicate to prove. Um, and I'll mention just one little bit about it uh, soon. Um, then Vashi in 2013 gave a sort of general framework that applies to much more general stationary space times than just Curtis Sitter. But in the concrete setting of Curtis Sitter space times, uh, his results show that um, if you have a not too fast rotating Curtis Sitter 
metric. So where the angular momentum is less than roughly 0.866 times the mass, and there's some extra um, technical hypothesis. Um, then you have this expansion um, for some fixed constant C positive. Okay, so you get an asymptotic expansion, whether or not the terms in this expansion are exponentially decaying or bounded is left open, but you do have an expansion up to exponentially decaying error terms. And um, uh, work by Vashi and uh, uh, Oliver Lindblad Peterson um, just last year um, extended this result to the full sub extremal range of Curtis Sater black holes. So I haven't defined this properly, but um, basically, just like in the Kerr case, there's this function um, that has to have two simple positive roots. Um, that uh, and, you know this condition gives rise to exactly the sub-extremality condition. In the Curtis iter case, there is uh, again a similar function that appears as a metric coefficient, and that has to have the appropriate number of positive simple roots. Um, okay, and that gives you a condition on what it means to be sub-extremal. Um, okay, and so what they prove is again this expansion for just some fixed number c, some uh, positive fixed number c, and the bound on this number c is uh, determined essentially by some properties of the trapped set in this case. So it's in principle explicit, uh, more or less explicit, but um, it is definitely not um, a result for arbitrary c. So in other words, um, if you take this peterson bashi result, then uh, the only thing that's left to be done um, in order to really um, finish off this linear wave equation on Curtis iter um, as far as long time asymptotic behavior is concerned, would be to extend the result to um, all C. Okay, and that would require um, detailed information about these quasinormal modes omega j, um, even in this full sub extremal range, which seems to be hard to come by. I also want to mention uh, two more works that are um, not sort of inspired by this uh, spectral theoretic um, picture. So there's one paper by Mavro Giannis uh, just from last year in the Schwarzschild-Hissiter case, um, which uh, establishes exponential decay to constants um, using uh, a vector field method uh, rather than um, sort of spectral theory. Um, and so in this case, you have exponential decay with some small positive rate to constants. Um, and uh, Alan Fang has work in progress actually on the nonlinear stability of the curtis Sitter um, uh, family of metrics, again, in the very slowly rotating case. Um, and so he also has some uh, results that are related to this exponential decay here. Okay, and uh, also there's, um, so when I mentioned the vector field method, um, the, the first result there was um, super polynomial decay to constants uh, by Dafermas and Rodnianski. Okay, so this much for um, uh, this theorem. And now the main question, as I said, um, in order to determine whether you have decay rather than merely an expansion into mystery terms, is to figure out what these omega j's are. And so um, these omega j's are the resonances or quaternional modes of the curtis Sitter black hole. And they do not depend on the initial conditions, but they only depend on the space time, so on the black hole parameters. Um, so that's why I label the collection of these omega j's q and m of lambda m and a. And uh, you can define that set um, very concretely here. Namely, it's the set of those complex numbers, omega, for which there exists a mode solution, which is smooth up to and uh, across both horizons. So that's some of the boundary condition, uh, two boundary conditions that need to be satisfied. And that picks out a discrete set of frequencies, omega. Okay, and so here I just uh, reminded you what it means to be a mode solution, namely exactly um, a solution of the wave equation um, of this decoupled form. And if you want to define them analytically or somehow, you know, uh, somehow find the set in some sense, um, there are uh, sort of two main approaches very closely related. One of them is um, to um, look at the meromorphic continuation of some spectral family inverse, some resolvent. So basically, you take the wave operator, which is time translation invariant. So the first thing that you should think of um, is to take the Fourier transform, so replace time derivatives by multiplication by a frequency omega. Um, and then you can um, show um, that uh, this resulting spectral family um, can be inverted on an appropriate Sobolev spaces. Um, and another approach pioneered by Warnick in 2015 is that uh, you can define these resonances omega actually as honest eigenvalues um, of some uh, solution semigroup to the wave equation. Um, but they give the same sets. Okay, so what is now known about the um, actual set of quasinova modes of Curtis Sitter space times? Um, okay, so, and what is desired? So the, the simplest thing that you might desire is mode stability, which is the statement that either all these quasinormal modes omega j have strictly negative imaginary part, that would correspond to uh, the corresponding term here being exponentially decaying, or um, if it 
doesn't have negative imaginary part, it should just be the um, uh, omega j equals zero corresponding to a constant in time term. And in that case, uh, you would also like to say that the corresponding aj of x can only possibly be a constant. Okay, so that would uh, imply then mode stability would imply um, exponential decay to constants of solutions of this linear scalar wave equation. Now, when is mode stability known? Um, in the case that a is equal to zero, you have a short Schwarzschild black hole. It's extremely easy. It's some simple integration by parts argument uh, or imaginary part of omega positive and some sort of Bronskian uh, argument for uh, real resonances. So it's very easy. Um, and uh, so Yakov just so, you know, suggested some problems for undergrad students. I suppose that's an very appropriate one. Um, it is also known for very small angular momenta via a perturbative argument. So um, that was. Um, concretely written uh, down in the papers by Dyatlov and Bashi that I mentioned. Um, but it is not a direct argument, so you don't somehow directly integrate something by parts and uh, you know, get the result out like that, but it's really a perturbative, um, perturbative result. Basically, one says that the resonances move continuously under varying the black hole parameters, but for the schwarzschild case, you know there's exactly one resonance at zero, then a bunch in the lower half plane, and then you show that this, uh, this situation is stable under perturbations. Um, the tr trickiest part there is to control the very high frequency resonances that they don't somehow suddenly cross the real axis into the positive. Okay, so this, uh, this is as far as most stability um, goes, so rather little. Um, in the high energy regime, one can say a lot more. Some of this is not surprising because after all, the full quasi-normal mode spectrum is um, somehow very naively akin to the full Laplace eigen, you know, Laplace spectrum of some explicit metric on some compact Riemannian manifold. It's very easy, like Weil's law, to say something about uh, the uh, high frequency or the large eigenvalues, but saying something um, about the low-lying uh, eigenvalues lie exactly here. That's typically very difficult to do, um, except perhaps numerically. So the higher energy regime, uh, the reason why this is tractable is that you have uh, sort of semi-classical or WKP methods at your disposal. And that's exactly what Savareto and Swarovski in the late 90s used um, when they proved the following. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, when they proved that um, in, uh, so that the resonances for a schwarzschild sitter black hole are approximated by the following explicit expression. So first of all, um, so this, their theorem is slightly more general than what I'm, what I'm going to say, but roughly speaking, you fix um, uh, um, a line, imagine you're part of omega equals minus a constant, say minus 100, and then you want to find out what the resonances are um, above that line when the real part is extremely large. In reality, they actually allow for some slightly conic angle here. So it's a stronger result. What they prove is that um, in that um, regime, in sort of bounded half, so in uh, half bounded half spaces, um, the quasi normal modes are very well approximated by these uh, omega LNs, which lie on an approximate lattice. Okay, so don't worry about the actual constant here. Um, I just put them in for honesty. There are two things I want you to notice. One thing is, uh, you know, this number here lies on a lattice. L is uh, an angular momentum, I mean, the multipole moment and n um, uh, counts the overtone number. So that uh, starts uh, at one, I believe, or zero. Um, and there's also an explicit numerical factor here. And uh, the, the one thing that I want to point out for later use is that um, this factor is basically like one over m. So if the black hole mass is very small, the Sabareto zworski resonances or um, WKB resonances, they were, you know, they were known before in some way, but uh, not rigorously proved so. Um, they scale like one over the mass. And because they have negative imaginary part, when the black hole is extremely small, um, they have extremely large negative imaginary part. So they would co contribute very fast decaying terms in this expansion here. Um, nonetheless, these uh, kinds of things are what one seems to be able to uh, measure in uh, gravitation wave experiments. Um, OK. Dyatlov then uh, extended the Sabareto Tworsky result to the Kerr de Sitter setting, in which case it's not quite a lattice anymore. There's some extra splitting um, uh, depending on this second parameter M of spherical harmonics um, that takes into account the presence of this angular momentum. So it's a very precise formula for the high frequency resonances. But again, they scale like one over M. And so they're a very fast decaying contributions to the latum asymptotics if the black hole is small. Okay, so this is the high energy regime. And in general, uh, what is known by the result by Peterson and Bashi is that you have um, uh, actually uh, only finitely many 
potential enemies to exponential decay. So at most finitely many quasi normal modes lie in the, clo uh, in the closed upper half plane. We already know there's one at zero corresponding to constant solving the wave equation. Um, but this result by Peterson and Bosch does not yet rule out the possibility that there might be, I don't know, three quasi normal modes with positive imaginary part for some Curtis iter parameters. Okay, so here's the cartoon at the bottom of the slide um, of um, what's known about this quasi normal spectrum. It's uh, so Peterson and Bashi um, uh, includes the statement that um, in the upper half plane for large real parts, there are no quasi normal modes. What's completely trivial to show is that for sufficiently large positive imaginary part, there are no quasi normal modes, because that just amounts to the statement that solutions of the wave equation obey some very terrible but uh, sort of fixed exponential upper bound in time. And that follows by um, uh, completely naive energy estimate. Okay, but there's still the possibility, as I said, that um, uh, you have uh, quasi normal modes in the upper half plane. And you can also be a little bit more ambitious and actually ask, can you say something about uh, resonances sort of in some large uh, bounded region here as well? Okay, so um, again, why should I care about this? One thing I already mentioned that if you have actually exponential instabilities, even if it's just a one dimensional one, so just a single quasi normal mode in the upper half plane, that would be disastrous for nonlinear problems because then already the linear problem exhibits an instability. So the nonlinear one is going to be even worse. And uh, sort of a fun motivation uh, for me, I suppose, was that uh, Maciek Zworski has a review article on resonances mostly concerned with hyperbolic dynamics in 2017. And um, uh, there was a five year window in which one had to prove some conjectures. One conjecture was most stability for Curtis Hitter black holes in some large-ish uh, parameter regime. And uh, before the five years were up, I decided to um, quickly prove this theorem. And uh, now I get a free two-star dinner at some point in the future. OK, um, good. So what's the theorem um, that I proved? So this is a paper from uh, on the archive from uh, late December 2021. And the statement is the following. So we fix um, the black hole, uh, sorry, the cosmological constant to be uh, positive. And uh, you fix the angular momentum to mass ratio to be some number strictly less than one. And then the statement is when the mass is sufficiently small, then mode stability holds for the Curtis Hitter black hole with parameters lambda, m, and a. So that's number one. And number two is that uh, quasi normal modes um, so there's actually more information you can obtain, namely quasi normal modes in uh, a half space, imaginary part omega is bigger than minus a constant for any value of the constant C um, lie approximately in this very explicit set, namely uh, you have this uh, uh, you know, equally spaced numbers um, along the negative imaginary axis. So it's not just actually that they lie in this set, so it's not an inclusion, but it's actually uh, also sort of the other way around. Every number in the set here is actually the limit of a sequence of quasi normal modes for a Curtis Hitter black hole with these kinds of parameters for sufficient, so as m goes down to zero. Okay, so you actually have sort of continuous families of quasi normal modes that uh, converge to any um, desired element of this set here. Okay, so um, we have convergence to the set, and in fact, the theorem states uh, even more that you know, namely have convergence also of the corresponding mode solutions in an appropriate topology. So smooth topology are basically away from uh, r equals zero because the black hole is disappearing as the mass goes down to zero. So you want to stay away from r equals zero, but then you have convergence of mode solutions uh, away um, from r equals zero, um, also including with multiplicity and so on. So it's uh, sort of the whole thing. Okay, so here's a picture um, of um, what this does. Uh, so again, um, lambda uh, being fixed and positive, you pick, uh, you pick any uh, half space here, any imaginary part omega equals a constant line and look above and the resonances are one exactly at zero with mode solutions being constants. And then uh, I drew this fuzzy set here. So there are uh, you know, an exact ex explicit number of quasi normal modes that lie somewhere in, this, uh, in these um, uh, little gray balls here. And then uh, what happens down here? Well, you know, that's uh, up, up to debate, but uh, importantly, the quasi normal mode spectrum is controlled in the full uh, half space here, including at high frequencies. Okay, so there's really nothing else. Uh, so in other words, if you plug this information into the asymptotic expansion at late times of waves, you get exponential decay to constants actually with an explicit rate, namely e to the minus t star times square root lambda over three minus some epsilon. And the epsilon goes down to zero when the mass goes down to zero. Okay, so the uh, exponential decay rate converges precisely to this number here. 
OK, and so um, here is finally the promised um, uh, sort of phase diagram of sub-extremal Curtis-Sitter black holes in terms of dimensionless quantities. So A over M is a one dimensionless thing, where, and uh, lambda times M squared is another dimensionless quantity. So for short to sitter it has to be less than 1 ninth. That's this uh, mystery number that I mentioned at some point. And uh, when lambda is equal to 0, or lambda M squared is equal to 0, um, the angular momentum to mass ratio has to be less than 1 so that you're in a sub-extremal curve regime. So mode stability had been known in this dark red region here, which also goes down a little bit here to this neighborhood of zero. And uh, my theorem now covers uh, the bright red regime here. So this is, of course, an artist's impression. Um, uh, I don't know how m actually has to, how small m has to actually be. Uh, one sort of uh, curious thing um, you might notice is that um, right here at this extremal curve point, uh, my set um, actually you know, doesn't include a neighborhood of uh, a full neighborhood of the A over M axis here. Um, and I'll explain the reason why um, that is not possible yet uh, to obtain later. Um, there's also some uh, numerical results of some paper from the 1990s by Brady, Chambers, Lara Kares, and Poisson. Um, this wasn't the main focus of the paper, but they do have some statements about, um, uh, at least in the schwarzschild sitter case, when the black hole is small, that the resonances are well approximated by um, exactly these sorts of numbers. And explain where these numbers come from in a minute. OK, so I suppose this is a good point to ask questions, if there are any. OK, so I'm um, hoping that I'm sharing my full screen. Um, I'm going to attempt to show you some video here. Um, OK, so this is a numerical evidence for the truth of my theorem um, in the case that A is equal to 0. So this, um, uh, this was actually a project that I gave an undergrad physics student at MIT um, before I moved. And um, so the task there was to write code that actually very accurately computes quasi normal modes, um, also when the black hole is extremely small. So the numerical um, slight issue is that uh, you basically have two length scales. One is the scale of the cosmological horizon, which is somewhat fixed. Um, but then you have this very small length scale when the black hole mass is very small. Um, and somehow you have to have sufficient resolution um, at both uh, to make this calculation work nicely. Um, OK, and so this is the output of this uh, calculation. Yu Jing Shi is the, the name of this undergrad. And um, so here you start with a black hole mass of um, you know, some explicit number here. Um, I think in this case, lambda, the cosmological constant, is equal to 3, if I remember correctly. And um, so he computes a whole bunch of quasi normal modes here. That's, of course, just a subset of the full set. And uh, the video, once I play it now, will show how the quasi normal modes behave as the mass of the black hole goes down to 0. OK, so you see that you have this approximate lattice here of quasi normal modes. And as the mass goes down to 0, uh, they actually get scaled away with 1 over m, exactly um, as uh, per my description of the sabaretsu zworski result. OK, so now they're, uh, I'm going to pause the video here. So they're now uh, very well on their way out of this picture. And now the theorem uh, regime slowly starts to kick in, which tells you something about um, uh, what the resonance actually do in some fixed upper half space, like imagine your part bigger than minus four, just for concreteness here. So all the subarator Zworski resonances, these, uh, these lattice points here, will depart from that region. And then uh, you should focus on the negative imaginary axis and see what happens there. And as you can see, the quasinormal modes indeed converge to this equally, great, uh, equally spaced um, negative imaginary integers up to scaling by square root of lambda over 3. OK, and so, oops, that was a little sudden here. OK, so, so I'm going to pause the video here. So there are some numerical artifacts, I presume. The theorem is certainly true. And um, yeah, so you see that for an extremely small mass black hole, the quasinormal modes uh, are all given by these numbers. I should immediately point out, um, OK, so going back to the talk here. I should immediately point out that um, uh, as far as, for instance, uh, gravitational wave measurements go, these are not the resonances that you will ever see. As I will explain, they're associated, so they're a resonance of the de Sitter space-time with no black hole present. And so in, in some vague sense, you have to wait for the entire time for the gravitation wave from some uh, settling down Curtis Sitter black hole to basically reach the region near the cosmological horizon and then get scattered back um, and only then will you actually start to see uh, this very slow exponential rate of decay here for any human time span or you know, these uh, 0.5 seconds that these gravitational wave measurements usually take place on. 
um, those uh, very fast decaying terms are actually the dominant ones. But I do not have a mathematical result um, somehow. Um, is uh, consistent with that yet. So some of what are the actual amplitudes with which certain quasi remotes get activated? Um, that is uh, uh, an interesting problem that um, is open. Okay, so here's uh, again the picture. Uh, so on the left hand side are some snapshots from the video that I just showed, uh, where you see the quasi normal mode set as the black hole mass goes down to zero. So I suppose here it's 0 0.0001 or something like that. And on the right hand side, uh, just for illustration, are the corresponding mode solutions uh, that correspond to this circled quasi normal mode here at like minus 2i or something like that. And uh, in blue, here is the mode solution on the Schwarzschild Tessiter space time. And as the mass of the black hole goes down to zero, this mode solution converges um, in uh, any region when r is positive to uh, the true, uh, so to the mode solution on the Sitter space. Okay, so down here, the two lines are indistinguishable. Okay. And uh, yeah, so this is a, a paper in joint work with um, uh, Xi. It actually just uh, was uh, published in JMP in 2022 now um, in the Schwarzschild Sitter case. And I'll say just a bit more about that paper later. Okay, so um, this much about the main theorem. And um, I just want to explain um, uh, the basic idea of how the argument goes. Um, so I mentioned that in the Schwarzschild Sitter case, you can prove mode stability by just some simple integration by parts argument um, and perhaps some Ronskin argument. Um, in the Curtis Sitter case, this has been attempted by, um, by a number of people, um, including I believe Umetsu and Suzuki and other people, um, but uh, it, it just didn't work out including attempting to mimic uh, Whiting's famous paper on the most stability of um, uh, um, the wave equation and other equations on Kerr, subextremal Kerr black holes, uh, where you use some integral transform to transform the relevant um, ODE in R once you have separated the wave equation entirely into T, R, and spherical or spheroidal harmonics. Um, so an integral transform for the uh, relevant radial ODE um, worked in the Kerr case but that somehow didn't seem to work at all in the Kerr de Sitter case. So somehow, um, uh, yeah, some of these algebraic um, uh, miracles don't seem to happen in the Kerr de Sitter case, um, or at least they're not known um, how to work. I'm going to say a bit more about the, the Kerr case uh, on the next slide. Okay, so um, rather than somehow relying on um, explicit um, such um, uh, integration by parts or explicit integral transform arguments, uh, the idea here is to regard um, this. Uh, problem of studying quasi normal modes for small black holes as a singular, uh, as a problem in singular analysis, and uh, to regard this as a singular limit. And I will explain uh, roughly how this goes. So, the, the elevator version is that um, the set of quasi normal modes for um, the de Sitter space time in which there's no black hole at all, um, that is known explicitly. And uh, we want to somehow perturb de Sitter space singularly by putting in a, a ever so slightly tiny black hole and prove that the quasi normal mode spectrum. Um, is actually stable under the singular perturbation. Um, one thing that I forgot to say, actually, so let me just go back here, is um, the following. So in this theorem, I fixed lambda to be positive and then let the mass of the black hole go down, go down to zero. Um, but of course, the statement is uh, um, uh, involves only dimensionless quantities. So really, uh, what you should uh, think of is lambda times m squared going down to zero. And then you have to restrict to quasi normal modes in the space uh, bigger than minus c times square root lambda. That's the correct scaling for the frequency. And um, the sort of dimensional analysis tells you that you can also get mode stability and the precise description of quasi normal modes um, in some upper half space in the setting that um, now, for instance, the black hole mass m is fixed, um, which is perhaps more appropriate for the actual universe. Say it's equal to 4 million times the mass of the sun. And then if lambda is sufficiently small, and it surely is small in the actual universe, then mode stability holds. Um, OK, so there's this other scaling um, that you can think of that's perhaps more physically relevant. OK, so coming back here to the singular limit, um, I mentioned it many times already, and now I'm going to make it concrete um, using the form of the metric. So let's just look for um, notational simplicity at the schwarzschild Sitter metric, which uh, I write down here again explicitly. And uh, remember that it has two horizons um, at roughly r equals 2m and cosmological horizon equals roughly 1 because I'm setting the cosmological constant to be equal to 3. OK, so if the black hole mass m is very small, then you can check that uh, these two numbers, 2m and 1, are basically zeros of this, uh, of this uh, factor 
1 minus 2m over r minus r squared. OK, so what's the first limit, uh, the naive limit that you could think of? Well, just um, stay a fixed distance away from the black hole, so fix some r positive, and just let the mass of the black hole go down to 0. Not surprisingly, the limiting spacetime has no black hole left anymore, and it is the decider metric, explicitly just given like here. Right? You just set m equals 0 in this expression. That's what you get. And um, uh, interestingly, but not surprisingly, the black hole has completely disappeared in this limit. Right? So this metric, uh, the decider metric with, positive, with uh, cosmological constant lambda equals 3 here, is actually smooth across r equals 0, which is where the black hole used to sit. OK, so it really just completely disappeared. Analytically, um, it's not quite the case. I'll explain in a second. OK, and for this naive limiting space time, the set of quasi modes can be computed explicitly. And that has been known also in the physics literature. I don't even know what the first paper doing that is, I must admit. Um, but for instance, the Brady et al paper that I mentioned uh, certainly does this, um, is this explicit set. And quasi modes for the sitter are um, defined in the same fashion. You pass to a nicer slicing of your space time with level sets that are transversal to the cosmological horizon, future cosmological horizon. Um, and then um, you want smooth mode solutions. Um, and that picks out this discrete set here. It's also a simple exercise in I don't know, hypergeometric functions if you're a fan of that. OK, so uh, the black hole has disappeared. Um, but uh, of course, for any positive value of m, there is a black hole. So where did the black hole go? And the fact that there's another limit in which the black hole actually remains there, even as m goes down all the way to 0, is exactly the hallmark, of course, of a singular limit problem. Um, OK, and so um, how do you realize this other limiting regime? Um, OK, so you pass to rescale coordinates. You put yourself in, into the shoes of somebody who stays basically a distance 10m, let's say, away from the black hole or the event horizon. So you pass to rescale coordinates r hat which is r over m, and you keep that bounded or fixed. You also have to rescale the time coordinate uh, accordingly for your sort of black hole local observer. And then you take the mass down to 0 for fixed r hat and t hat. And uh, if you do that naively, the metric just converts, I mean, the coefficients here converge to 0, but you have to look at a rescaled metric. So um, it's, you can see it here explicitly. If you divide the metric by this, um, this constant, m to the minus 2, which blows up as m goes down to 0, um, then you get here a dt over m squared. That's the d hat squared. And the prefactor becomes the following. So 2m over r just becomes 2 over r hat. And the r squared scales like m squared. That goes down to 0 in this limit. OK, so the limit, uh, limiting space time here, or limiting metric in this regime, is actually exactly the mass 1 Schwarzschild space time. Um, OK. And um, for this metric now, of course, there's still a black hole. The event horizon is still there. On the other hand, the cosmological horizon has now entirely disappeared because you sort of zoomed in closer and closer on some size m region inside of the sitter space, basically. So the cosmological horizon has uh, all but disappeared. Um, OK, so now it's an asymptotically flat metric. So I'm just highlighting this here in red. Um, OK, so one limit retains the cosmological horizon, but the black hole disappears. The other limit retains the event horizon, but the um, uh, asymptotic structure is changed to asymptotically flat. OK, so one other uh, sort of scaling consideration is here, this next bullet point. If we're interested in quasi normal modes of the original space time, um, so uh, imagine your part of omega is bigger than minus 10, let's say. That's where the theorem certainly applies. Um, what does it correspond to in terms of frequency for the local observer near the black hole? Well, if you pass to the t hat coordinate, you have to, so that means dividing time by m, you have to multiply frequencies, uh, frequencies by m. OK, so the frequency m times omega now um, has sort of uh, imaginary part with lim in bigger or equal than 0. OK, so I wrote it down here in some sort of rough version. So in other words, um, if you're interested in quasi normal modes in some upper half, so in some um, you know, upper half space, including the real axis, OK, so imagine your part bigger than minus 10, let's say, um, the black hole local observer actually only needs to know about mode stability in the closed upper half plane. OK. And um, so I didn't write it down, but uh, this, the theorem, my theorem also holds for the uh, Klein-Gordon case, for instance. Um, if the Klein-Gordon mass um, is held constant as you make the black hole disappear, and there's a similar scaling that you can do. So somehow um, the black hole local observer will actually see a massless scalar field um, in this low mass limit. Okay. So even though by work of Schlafentorf-Rothman, it's actually known that um, uh, Kerr, uh, so Kerr black holes uh, do not satisfy mode stability in general for the massive Klein-Gordon equation um, that does not matter 
uh, for the validity of mode stability or precise description of quasimodal modes for Kerr de Sitter black holes um, when the black hole mass is sufficiently small and the mass of, uh, the, mass of the scalar field is held fixed. So just as a little side note. Okay, so now needing some of for this uh, black hole local observer mode stability in the closed upper half plane, that's the point where um, one uh, picks up the literature and um, uses results as black box that were first proved by Whiting, as I mentioned, in the open upper half plane, and then uh, a well-known paper by Schlappen Rothman in 2015 in the closed upper half plane. And um, so these papers use um, uh, an integral transform, uh, as I already mentioned. And there's a recent work by uh, Casals and Teixeira da Costa, um, which um, uh, follows up on some physics work by um, um, uh, Grassi and uh, collaborators. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the two others. Um, uh, where there's uh, where they realize basically a discrete symmetry that this radial ODE satisfies, um, and uh, by passing sort of to uh, so a discrete set of transformations in some sense, and by using one of those uh, discrete transformations of the ODE, uh, one actually recovers basically this integral transform, but in a slightly more conceptual um, rather than a sort of black box and lucky guess manner. Okay, so these works here, um, in other words, are uh, used as black box inputs in my theorem, and um, I'll try to explain very briefly um, how these pieces then fit together. Okay, so um, what's the geometry and analysis that one does in the singular limit? Uh, so here I use some notation, which perhaps um, many of you are not quite familiar with. Um, it's a notation for a real blow up. Um, the idea is let's just focus on the simple case where you are interested in controlling quasi normal modes at fixed frequencies, so just some fixed omega, perhaps in a bounded set of omegas, but not in the full upper half space. That that adds a whole different asymptotic regime that causes a lot of extra work. Okay, so let's try control uh, to control quasi-normal modes in some fixed bounded region of, um, of frequency space, complex plane. Um, okay, so then um, the um, the black hole mass is going down to zero. Lambda here I'm holding fixed, say three. And uh, the spatial manifold is um, uh, certainly contained in 0, 2 in radius across a two sphere. And um, now remember that the event horizon actually scales with m. So as m goes down to 0, r plus behaves like 2m. So it would also go down to 0. And uh, somehow you wouldn't be able to resolve exactly the presence of a Schwarzschild black hole of mass 1 in some rescale limit. OK, so what this, uh, what this notation here accomplishes is what the picture depicts. Namely, you basically introduce at m equals r equals 0 at this uh, interesting limiting regime where the uh, sort of mass 1 Schwarzschild black hole somehow appears. You introduce a new coordinate r hat, exactly this r divided by m coordinate, and uh, declare um, sort of the manifold, the total space on which you do analysis. It includes both the spatial manifold as well as this parameter m. Um, you regard now this uh, function r hat um, as actually a smooth coordinate in some part of this space time here. Um, okay, so I hope the picture explains this uh, reasonably well. Um, you can think of this uh, blow up as introducing polar coordinates around m equals r equals zero. Okay, and so uh, drawn in this picture now are these dashed lines. These are the locations of the horizons. Once you do this blow up, they actually uh, tend to some, you know, the, the union of horizons over uh, all the small positive mass parameters is now actually a nice smooth analytic um, uh, submanifold of this total space that intersects um, uh, this front face here transversely. And there's also the cosmological horizon, which just tends to some you know, finite value r equals 1 when lambda is 3. The level sets of the m function of the mass function, these are, of course, exactly the spatial manifolds for the mass m Kerr de Sitter or Schwarzschild de Sitter um, uh, um, uh, space-time manifold. And uh, they, um, you know, they're somewhat drawn here schematically as this thick, thick dash, uh, sorry, thick blue line. And you see, as m goes down to zero, it actually becomes a singular limit because this uh, this blue line somehow separates into a piece along this blue curve and a piece along the red curve. Okay, so you exactly somehow pictorially see here the two uh, distinct limits. Um, Okay, so um, analytically, that one uh, then what one does is that one studies the spectral family. So one takes, uh, I already mentioned this before, one takes a Curtis iter metric. I'm dropping uh, uh, lambda and a here from the notation because lambda is fixed and the angular momentum a over m I'm also keeping fixed, less than one. And um, okay, so you replace basically time derivatives by multiplication by minus i omega. You get some family of operators depending both on the mass and of course on this frequency omega. And um, you regard 
this spectral family here, not as somehow an individual operator for each m, but actually as one single differential operator on this total space. Of course, it's sort of a horizontal operator only ever differentiates along the spatial directions, but if you regard it really as one single object, um, uh, it's sort of the, the right perspective to um, also keep track of its singular degeneration. Okay, and so then um, the name of the game is to prove uniform a priori estimates for the spectral problem here, and uh, ideally show then uh, you know, these, uh, and ideally estimates that actually uh, entail the injectivity of this operator here. And um, you have to invert two sort of, uh, you know, that involves estimates for two model problems, um, obviously. So one is the, um, uh, the model problem uh, on the schwarzschild kerr space time here, um, where you have to use the mode stability or some quantitative version of mode stability, some estimate version of this. Um, so that's something that you have by virtue of the results that I just quoted. And you also need to um, use the invertibility or quantitative estimates for this decider limiting problem. And of course, those estimates hold if and only if omega is not a quasi-normal mode. Okay? So in other words, if omega is not a quasi-normal mode, then you can show that uh, for small mass, um, omega is still not a quasi-normal mode of the small mass Curtis-Sitter or Schwarzschild-Sitter metric. And uh, in order to do the other way around, so if omega is a quasi-normal mode, prove that you have nearby quasi-normal modes for small mass black holes, um, that's done using uh, some sort of standard Roche um, theorem trick. Okay, so let's see, still have a few minutes. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna say um, one more explicit thing uh, about this analysis here. So one extra caveat that I just want to mention is that analytically and also geometrically in this, um, uh, in this total space picture, the black hole has not quite entirely disappeared uh, uh, from the decider perspective when M is equal to zero, because you see here that somehow um, there's actually, if you cross the whole picture with the two sphere, there's actually, um, you have sort of artificial polar coordinates uh, around R equals zero. And uh, so that analytically is some sort of conic singularity that you have to deal with. And um, um, okay, so that's one thing. Um, okay, and then uh, the function space on which you do the uniform analysis are exactly adapted to um, capture correctly the two limiting regimes. So when you're far away from the black hole, you just use d by dr to measure regularity. Close to the black hole, you measure with d by dr hat. Um, and so um, there's actually a uniform way to regard this name, the r d by dr, and of course, spherical derivatives. Um, okay, so you can set up sort of some uh, simple-minded function spaces um, uh, in which to do analysis. And you also have weights in these two limiting regimes. So um, if you're interested in this sort of sim singular analysis, um, uh, I encourage you to have a look at this paper with Xi uh, that just appeared in JMP which is the analysis for the schwarzschild sitter case um, in the case that you actually look at fixed spherical harmonics and it's just an ODE problem in this case. Okay, so I, and I'm not gonna say anything about the high frequency regime here. Okay, so what's the outlook? Um, the proof strategy is very flexible. And so um, in particular, it should apply with minimal changes to the Tchaikovsky equation, but that's not written down. So I shouldn't say it's true, um, but it should be true. And in that case, you need most stability for the corresponding sub-extremal occur limiting problem. And uh, so for various spin uh, uh, s over two or spin s, whatever, um, uh, wave equations, this was proved by uh, Anderson, Ma, Paganini, and Whiting. Um, another interesting question is, what about the full sub-extremal range for Kerr de Sitter? So the full, full range, you know, the full picture is probably unattainable, at least um, unless one finds some explicit integral transfer or something of the kind. Um, and this limiting analysis that I've uh, talked about um, does not actually give that either in a neighborhood of lambda equals zero because sub-extremal Kerr de Sitter parameters could limit to extremal Kerr parameters. And uh, unless you have some quantitative control of that limit, um, uh, you, know, you cannot extrapolate from that. So, um, so there are some references here for uh, ongoing work on extremal Kerr and mode stability for instance was proved by Teixeira da Costa. And as I mentioned, the long-term goal is to prove the nonlinear stability of Kerr de Sitter black holes in this almost full sub-extremal range um, covered by the theorem that I uh, painted in bright red um, in the middle of the talk. Okay, um, with that, I thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Let's thank Peter. All right, questions? Yes, Buzz. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, <clears throat> um, so I, I didn't, I mean, there were lots of things I didn't understand, but um, could you, uh, go, could you explain again the situation with the, um, I mean, what, what's, what's known or what, and what's expected concerning the mode stability in, uh, in the Kerr de Sitter case? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank for the question. So, um, what is uh, so? Uh, what is now known um, uh, by combining mode stability of Schwarzschild with this um, like little perturbative um, argument that was already known? Um, so that gives you this uh, dark red region here. The full gray region that is the full um, range of mm -hmm. subextremal Curtis mm -hmm. parameters, and uh, the red region is now what uh, my theorem uh, gives you mode stability for, um, and you know actually more information. So um, even if mode stability is somehow proved by magic means in the full subextremal range, my theorem actually still gives more information than that, uh, because it tells you also about quasi modes in the lower half plane. But um, okay, so that's a little. Thing. But but for the same region of uh, of parameters, or yeah, exactly only for this uh, for this red mm -hmm. region here. Mm -hmm. So in mm -hmm. other words, if somehow uh, somebody comes along and proves mode stability, say in the full subextremal range, so in this full um, uh, quadrangle yeah. here, um, then uh, um, I I wouldn't know uh, about these shallow quasi mm -hmm. modes. Um, either. So I really only have all this information in this red region and nowhere else. Mm -hmm. So as far as I understand, and, and the this, so you're saying that. You're saying that this there's there was some work by this uh, Rita Teixeira, mm -hmm. the, the Costa and, and collaborators, mm -hmm. uh, and I mean I, it wasn't clear to me what if that seemed like it it was a partial result. So that's mm -hmm. that's also what you're saying, right? So it's um, uh, no. So their result doesn't actually. Im so it gives a new proof of uh, mode stability for Kerr. So when lambda is equal mm -hmm. to zero, but as soon as you have uh, lambda positive, their result um, does not actually um, imply mode stability. So um, they uh, basically obtain, so I would have to look up the exact detail, but um, uh, for, um, uh, so they separate, you know, they, they ultimately look at uh, this radial ODE and there are all kinds of parameters, L and M and so on floating around. And um, for any value of, uh, so when the black hole rotation A is non-zero, Lambda is positive. There exists for um, all L's or M's. I would have to check again. An open interval, actually, even on the real axis, where their theorem um, doesn't say anything. Okay, so what one can prove mm -hmm. with integration by parts tricks and so on um, is uh, that there are no modes, uh, even for the Curtis Sitter case, full subextremal range, um, except possibly in some uh, you know fairly explicit uh, set that in involves uh, so that contains an open interval on the real line, or actually an infinite union of such open intervals and also mm -hmm. whole large swaths in the upper half plane. So they do not have, uh, so what their result actually so, does so it's do- not this, the full result in any case. No, not, not at all. So yeah. what their yeah. result does okay. do is that it shrinks the size of the intervals for which uh, mm -hmm. one is ignorant by a little bit, but it doesn't shrink them down to zero. Mm -hmm. There's a okay. chance that one can somewhat tweak their argument to somehow get a sharper result but um it's certainly not clear to me no i mean it um, what what would be nice is to have some argument like in the you know, some um, argument like in the in the most ability uh, proof involving uh, but one that needs some new ideas yeah exactly so i remember <laughs> talking the nature to of the equation is quite different yeah yeah exactly so um i remember talking to Jakob some many years ago i mean he's clearly moved on to more interesting things. But um, uh, yeah, he. Uh, I think he had looked at this a little bit. And as I said, there are um, a number of the, the Japanese mm -hmm. teams, for instance, that have looked at this and also sort of general transformation theory for the Hoyne equations. And it just seems like uh, nobody was able to make any real headway yeah, out there. Yeah, there's been some new ideas. So, yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Perhaps I can just mention sort of in this rough context that um, as you can roughly see from the analysis, the main inputs um, that make this theorem true is uh, mode stability for the Kerr limiting problem. So that you know, uh, is known and uh, knowledge of the modes of the De Sitter problem, which is typically very easy and explicit to calculate. But it doesn't mm -hmm. actually matter at all um, that um, one has exact Kerr De Sitter black hole space times for any positive value of the mass. So somehow any, um, you know, any family of metrics, stationary metrics, that have the correct limiting behavior 
um, uh, are subject to this theorem. Um, of course, I didn't specify exactly what that means now, but uh, it, it is not important for this theorem to hold that Curtis iterative space times are, you know, that you have complete separability of the wave equation and so on. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. Well, let's thank Peter again. For thank you very much. much.